Paul, I have bad news this week. Again? This is becoming a pattern. Do we need an intervention, Seamus? Right? Yeah, I think we need to have an intervention. We all need to sit down in a room and talk to the video game industry and let it know that, hey, we love you, we care about you, but this behavior can't continue. This is self-destructive. <laughs> We're here because we love you. And you're fucking annoying to us. <laughs> <laughs> so, CD Projekt Red is dead. I mean, not literally. Oh, man. But, you know, the two weeks ago, the beloved game de developer that everybody just... Like, hey, I always get my stuff through their store, no DRM, good return policy. They care about gamers. This is the one company that's run by us, the gamers. And yeah, they've, they've had a couple of rough patches over the past couple of years, but I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's fine. Everybody makes mistakes. But now, this week the mask fell off. That's always uncomfortable. Right. So, this is... Um, no, it's not one week of news. Okay, this is a little more than one week of news, but not much. This is like a week and a half of news. In this last 10 days or so, there have been... There was the whole thing I talked about last week. The review shenanigans, where they did not give anybody review copies for the last gen consoles. So nobody could like honestly review that game and show you how it looked and they set up yeah. the review and, and this is the kind of thing oh. that other studios or other developers or other publishers do from time to time and it's always kind of like oh come on everyone knows that's a, a dick move um, exactly but for cdpr to do it it's like really come on guys you like we i thought you were gamers right like we thought that you were on our team here Right. And for the disaster, like the constant delays and crunch for CD Projekt Red, um, or for Cyberpunk 2077, I've been assuming it was just incredible project management problems. Some dysfunction within the company, you know, maybe people changing projects and nobody really has a handle on where the project is. You know, that was my explanation for why this company had this terrible thing happen. But no, then it came out, I think in an investor's meeting, or I forget, it was a, I, I should have saved the link here. But anyway, it came out that no, it was just management was pushing for a ridiculous timeline. Like, <clears throat> the, the question I asked last week was, okay, this game was supposed to come out in, in March. Then they delayed it all the way till December, and they crunched, and they cut content, and yet still, despite all of that, they did not get the game done in time. So why was March ever on the table? <laughs> why was anybody well, ever talking and about And there's March? still way too much content. I mean, like, too much, but there's so much content in there. So, like, they cut something, but it wasn't enough. Like right. you can you can have it you can have it either way, but you can't have it both ways at once. Right. And this was just management was just pushing for them to and we thought, oh crunch, you know, project gets delayed, feature creep, but no, this was just management set a timeline that made crunching inevitable, which goes against previous things they have said in public that, you know, we're not going to have to crunch on this and, you know, we care about our workers and then you set some insane timetable. So that shows not just a mistake or bad management problem, which can be fixed. You can just learn to be a better manager. But if you have character flaws, like you don't care about about the condition of your product and you don't listen to the people who work for you and you don't understand how how timelines work and you don't understand how time works then there's no helping you 
Yeah, well, and especially if you publicly say one thing and then are actively pursuing different strategies right. in private. Right. I mean, it's, that's a really, really bad sign. Right. It's a huge red flag that this is a problem with character and not a problem with competence. Yeah. And then, on top of that, is the refund disaster. They, okay, so this is the third bad story of the last, like, 10 days. They posted in public, they made this sort of press release thing saying, Hey, everybody, we know you're having trouble returning. Oh, for context, people are trying to return the game. Like, you know, you own a PlayStation 4, the game runs at 15 frames a second and looks awful. You feel like you've been lied to and you want to return it. Right. But the normal policy is, hey, you play the game for more than two hours. So, you bought it, right? <laughs> hmm. And yeah. normally, and normally that's the rule. And I can understand that for, you know, the typical AAA games, you know, five hours. <laughs> not, not so much these days, but for a long time, you know, you buy a game and you play it for five hours and you hit, reach the ending credits and, and you're done. Um, so, you know, I can understand that's, that's a major, but you played 40% of the game. You can't return it after that, but yeah. Sony, Sony's like refund policy is, Hey, more than two hours, we, we won't do a refund because you know, this is not a rental service. We don't want to be doing millions of returns for people that just want to rent the latest game. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But, and so people were mad because you know two hours isn't even of an, isn't even enough time to get out of the prologue, unless you're a speedrunner. <laughs> like this game is so but big. Is it enough time to see that it's janky? Is a question. Um, I wonder about that. I wonder about that. You can make the case that yeah, in two hours you could not get out to the main. Po you could play this game for two hours and not reach the really free open world stuff where you're you're driving around on your own um or you you know oh i discovered that when i drive through city center that doesn't happen until you get you know five hours into the game you can't you can't reach city center and maybe when you get to city center that's where you get 15 frames a second and the game's unplayable so i can see people playing for a couple hours and thinking, oh, I just need to push through this and then I'll get to the good part and then realize, oh no, everything's buggy. I can't deal with this. I got to return it. So CD Projekt Red says, no problem. We understand you're in a diff. Don't worry. We've got your back. We're going to be doing refunds for everybody. So they said, please get in contact with us. If you do that, they just create a they just dump you in Sony's lap. Like, here, this person wants a refund. Now, that's how people described it. I don't know what that means. Like, do they create a support ticket for you or what? I'm, I'm not sure how it worked. But the point is, they made a big promise. And then they just, like, left it to the platform holder to fulfill the promise. They oh, acted no. like, yeah. They're like, okay, Sony, here's the deal. You're going to have a special return policy for this one game. And Sony's like, what? No. And they're like, yes, that's what you're going to do. And we've already told everyone. And so that's just, right. you're going to do that, right? And Sony's like, no, 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 of course not. Why would we do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. That is a very accurate description of how they did. They were just like, Sony, we let everybody know you're going to return the game anyway. And Sony's like, what? So the game was, so that's, again, that shows a lack of character. That's not a mistake. Like, whoops, we forgot to call Sony and clear this with them. This is just a weasel move. And, and then the last story. Okay, this requires a bit of setup. A couple years ago, there was a game called Devotion. It was made by a Taiwanese developer. You, you know, Taiwan, the country that is completely distinct from China and is not at all part of China. You you know that country, Paul. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on who you ask, I guess. But <laughs> right. you, yes, yes, I know that one. 
<laughs> there are some Taiwanese developers made a, a horror game called Devotion. In that game, they compared China's leader to Winnie the Pooh, which is absolutely not allowed in China. But is presumably allowed in Taiwan. And presumably allowed here in the West. Mm. So two years ago, I think, or one year ago, Steam had this flood of complaints about the game uh, from China. Now, you know, some people say, oh, these are people that, you know, China employs to hang out on the internet and post stuff, or it's a bunch of bots or whatever. I, it doesn't matter. People in China were outraged that this game was allowed to exist on the Steam store when it made fun of China's leader. So Steam mm. took the game down. Y you can't buy it on Steam even if you live in the United States. Wow. Yeah, so that sucks. But no problem. Last week, CD Projekt Red made this big announcement. Oh, and then in 2019, the Taiwanese developers removed that joke that making fun of Winnie the Pooh. I forget his name, so I keep calling him Winnie the Pooh, which makes the problem worse for him. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, it, they removed the joke, so now there is no supposedly offensive content in this game, but it still isn't back up on Steam. But CD Projekt Red came forward this, this week and said, no problem, hey, we're putting this game on our platform, no problem. It will be available. Five hours later, they posted, due to feedback from gamers, we are no longer going to put this on our platform. Hmm. Like, okay, so there are several problems here. <laughs> yeah. Wait, <laughs> where do you start on that one? Right. Like, for one thing, there's an obvious communication problem within the company. Like, Somebody made this decision without running it up, you know, to management. Hey, can we actually put this on our platform? They just proudly announced we're going to put this on our platform. Number two. Yeah. Hey, does anybody mind if we just flip the big old double deuce to China? That one of the largest, right. probably the largest market in the world. Right. So then there is that miscommunication. Number two, obviously somebody from China called them. You know, they... You, you do not get backlash from... We know what backlash from gamers looks like. It's angry forum threads that burn from, for days and then people realize, okay, we, this is go, getting crazy. Let's listen to the mob and do whatever they want. That doesn't happen in five hours. Moreover, if you, right. go to the, yeah. if you go to the forums, there are no such angry threads where people demand that they not sell... I demand you not sell me this game. Um, I'm offended, sir, that you have chosen to <laughs> allow this small developer to sell their game that doesn't even contain any offensive content anymore. <laughs> right, exactly. That, that used to contain it. So then not only that, but then they decided, so then they immediately caved. Within the space of five hours, they immediately caved to China. And then the thing that this should, this... This isn't really the worst thing, but it's the thing that I find most offensive. They decided to lie about it. And not only did they lie about it, like, you could tell a lie like, oh, wait, we, you know, we realized we've got some legal problems. We, we can't offer this. The licensing agreement isn't working out. We'll get back to you and then just wait for the whole thing to blow over. Like, that would be a normal, smart person lie. We wouldn't necessarily buy it, but it's, you know plausible sort of some people would believe yeah it. you'd be like okay I, yeah it sounds like they got pressure from china along unofficial channels and they've had to withdraw this idea but okay at least they're being smart about how they're phrasing it right but instead they were like pressure from gamers which is such a an outrageously obvious clumsy stupid tone-deaf lie like, I can't, I, I want to believe you. 
I want to believe you. I'm I've drank your Kool-Aid. I'm joined your I'm a member of the cult. Uh, I'm willing to believe whatever dumb bullshit you say, but that is too ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I I I nobody can believe that. And again, this shows just an absolutely horrible lack of character. This isn't like, oh, you made a mistake because you don't know what you're doing. This is, you have a problem as an individual. Be, you have trouble being a good person. Right. Oh, no. And you, don't, and you don't understand how the cult, like, you're serving gamer culture and you don't understand the culture well enough to know that nobody could possibly buy this lie. Or you have such contempt for your your audience that you're unwilling to like that that you really don't care what they think it would have been better to say or nothing at the very yeah at the very least that you have internal culture problems where some people are like oh we're this gamer run company and we're going to support free speech because of course we will and then another section of the company is like no we have to be very careful about how we do this or we're going to get you know assassinated by chinese operatives or whatever like i I'm, I'm sure that there is a huge amount of pressure and i'm i'm not faulting them for um acceding to demands from incredibly powerful <laughs> multinational forces but like right it, there's some dissonance inside the company at the very least right and i i actually i actually think it's a bad i realize that china is the biggest market in the world and that like you know 20 years ago imagine giving up the north american market like that'd be suicide yeah who are you selling to right. america that's it um, but I would even say in a business sense, it's incredibly dangerous. Like, think about the motivation behind this. Th this game does not contain any offensive content anymore. There's no reason to... Like, even if it did contain that joke, how petty and insecure are you? Like, how cringy insecure are you that you can't let people in your country make fun of you like that is laughable you are a ridiculous human being if you if you're like willing to like control speech because people on the internet make fun of you you're a joke an incredibly powerful joke but you're a joke as a person but then on top of that like they remove the joke and you still want to punish the developers like you run one of the most powerful countries in the world and this is a couple of guys in their garage in Taiwan and you want to crush them because they hurt your feelings like how petty how neurotic how ridiculous um and so getting back to the business angle do you really want that petty neurotic ridiculous incredibly dangerous person to have control over your company because that's what that's what you're giving them if you if you say okay i'm willing to do what you say to do business in china they will never stop asking for things this is not a one time deal yeah yep well yeah it's a it's a very difficult situation and i'm glad that i'm not in it um, right <laughs> right my, my, but it doesn't my seem like they handled it well and, yeah. No, my inclination would be like, "Hey, I'm you know, if this happened to me, I'd be like, well, I'm I'm doing okay in the West. Like, I'm currently earning my living from people in the West. Maybe I could maybe I could make five times more if I appealed to Chinese people. But you know, if I started writing my blog in Chinese or whatever, you know, I did something to appeal to the Chinese market and I could make five times as much, but I'd have to get approval from the Chinese government for everything I post. I'd be like, hell no, I'll just, I'll just stick with what I got. I'm burning a living. <laughs> this is working. That sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. Well, and you don't, that's the thing, right? You don't actually get approval from China. What you do is you right. think before you say anything, 
would anyone in China, in the Chinese authority have a problem with this? And that's why they're punishing these guys for, you know, even after they took the joke out, is because they were supposed to know before they made the joke exactly. that they weren't allowed to make the joke. Right. And when they do punish you, they're not going to say, you made a joke that offends us. What's going to happen is you offend them, and then some months later they will do something horrible to you, you know, destroy a bunch of your company, limit your ability to to do business they will like put some horrible seemingly unrelated you will suddenly run into some bureaucracy that's inexplicable and you can't clear up and you can't do business and that'll go on for a while and then maybe it'll clear up and you're supposed to get the message don't do that again like do you that's the future you're you go you're buying into that future when you decide you want to do business in china i yeah. wouldn't do that I wouldn't do that for anything. I wouldn't do that for billions of dollars. <laughs> That's just so awful. Yeah, it doesn't sound like fun. So CD Projekt Red, in one week, basically turned themselves into EA. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. I, I know that like a little bit of hyperbole is funny, but that's not, that's not quite fair, is it? Um, obviously they didn't really turn themselves into EA. They sort of revealed that they have all the same character flaws as the EA leadership. Just sort of yeah. lying, duplicitous, intellectually lazy, craven, artistically bankrupt, uh, and incredibly short-sighted, and tone-deaf, and not really understanding the culture they're serving. And that's a pretty big list of flaws. It's almost like a Dilbert cartoon now. Right. So that's that's a shame. Um, GOG is no longer my platform of choice. I mean, it's not that Steam is better. It's that I consider that I, I don't see that, you know, GOG is morally superior to Steam anymore. It's like, okay, these are both big self-interested corporations that only see the hobby as a way to make money. All right, well, if I'm going to flip a coin between the two, I'll just take, use the platform that's more convenient, which is Steam. Yeah, and and uh, at least more open about where they stand. Yeah, they yes, yeah, Steam is not pretending to be my buddy. Gabe Newell isn't out there memeing about how we're all just best buds. Yeah. Oh, man, that is heartbreaking, though. It's... Yeah. Right. Especially the the esp the real thing that made me think the company was really on our side was the anti DRM stance. But you know, that's okay. Your your broken clock is right once. <laughs> so tell me something happy, Paul. Tell me tell me you had a good time this week. Yeah, I um I haven't been playing. I, you know, it was last week. I was playing Mind History. And so this week, uh, I've been playing more Mind History. It's it's very it's very good. I don't know if it's good. It's uh, it's addictive, I guess. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of optimization to do, and it's yeah. It's I've been having a good time with it. In the show notes, you mention a bug. What's going on there? Yeah. Well, I would say well, I've been having a good time, but not everything's perfect. And uh, when it, so on the return it. <laughs> I've been playing it over two hours, Seamus. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so, uh, in in version six, there's a planetary. There's like a planet map, and you can go to all the different sectors, and they're connected together, and you can hop from one to the other, and it's all this stuff. Um, and so I've I've made like a, a a drop pod basically, where I can just drop down a core with some guns around it, and then just forget about it and go on and you know and just drop a whole bunch of these into a bunch of sectors and then conquer all the sectors without actually interacting with it um but that means that there's all these sectors that aren't developed at all and so i wanted to do a survey so i went to each sector and looked at the the area and it's like okay bring up the mini map and so you can see the whole thing at once um because you can't really zoom out far enough in the in the normal view um, right that's enough normal view yeah and uh, so, so you zoom out in the mini-map and you look at the whole thing and then uh, you can press N to go directly to the planet view. But if you do that with the mini-map open, 
you uh, encounter a, a, a bug where you can't rename sectors anymore. So what I was doing is I was naming the sectors based on my survey of them, you know, they've got oh, this right. resource or that resource right. or whatever. Um, so, you, Ad hoc so you have to close system. the... Yeah, well, and, and it's nice that you can rename the sectors now. Apparently earlier in version 6 you couldn't even do that. But, uh, so, so you get to this problem where if you try to rename the sector when you got to the planet view from the minimap open, uh, the sector name, the menu opens, but the sector name isn't editable, like there's no cursor there and stuff. So like, oh, this seems like a bug. And in the in the main menu, or yeah, in the main menu, you can click info or whatever, and there's all these links for like, suggest a feature, uh, report a bug, here's the wiki, here's the stuff. And it's like, oh, perfect, I'll just click the report a bug problem, you know, link, takes you to their GitHub, and uh, type in, you know, Here's, it's got this little template, you know, here's the problem, when I do this thing, you know, this, this happens, this doesn't seem like what's supposed to happen, so it looks like a bug. Um, and so I submitted it, and uh, to his credit, the developer came back, I think it's it's spearheaded by this guy, this single guy, and then he's got some guys he contracts with, or there's like some community um, contributions or something, but the main guy responded very quickly. I think it was like four minutes. He let you, yeah, a whole four minutes, and he let you know you're playing the game wrong, and don't do that. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not quite exactly how he said it. I think the words were, um, if you can look it up on the GitHub if you want, but uh, the words were something like the the mini map has keyboard focus. Uh, don't rename directly from the minimap, you know, and it's like, okay, it, I understand that, like, it's a hassle to change it, but this is a bug, like, it's not like this is, right. it's not like this is a, like, intended operation, like, you explained, oh, and, and he closed the, he closed the ticket, so he's like, ticket closed, oh. will not fix, uh, oh, I hate that, this is, you know, I this is the problem, that. And it's like, I okay, well, what I... you did was you explained why it would be a pain for you to fix this bug. But you didn't fix the bug, and you didn't explain that it's not a bug. <laughs> like... So I was like, all right, fine. So I rolled up my sleeves, and I submitted a feature request. Please make it easy to change the name of the sector. And then, like, here's why. It's a hassle right now, because you have to... Close the mini map, go to the screen, and then the, you can't just like press F2 or whatever to rename the sector. And the sector doesn't have focus when you go to the world map because supposedly like you're going to world map in order to go somewhere else, to travel somewhere. And I understand like that's right. what you'd normally do. But like the thing that I'm trying to do is made difficult by all these decisions. So I was like, hey, here's what I do. Here's why it's difficult based on all these decisions. And then in the, um, in the template for a feature request, he's like, Please check all these boxes. Go and read the planned features. Go and read the uh, all the features that have been uh, declined, right? Like, go do a search on the feature request thing to see if someone else suggested right. this. And all that stuff. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Like, you don't want to be hassled and harassed by people suggesting, hey, wouldn't it be cool to put turrets on top of miners? Wouldn't that be the best? He's like, no, that wouldn't be the best. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I put it, I put it in the document. Go and read that document. So, like, yeah, got it. So I went and looked, and, you know, no one else had suggested this feature because naming sectors is relatively new, so it's not like anyone would have run into this problem before, or at least not very, you know, very frequently. And um, and then on his, his plan, one of the items in the... I think he's got a Trello that's got the whole, you know, roadmap for all the features he wants to add and stuff he's planning on doing, and one of them is, like, complete UI overhaul. And so I referenced that. I'm like, hey, okay, uh... You know, probably this can wait until the complete UI overhaul. And probably that's what he was thinking when he was like, I'm not going to fix it right now. I'm going to wait until I overhaul the UI and then, you know, we'll, everything will change. So, uh, <laughs> but then another user, so he doesn't respond to feature requests. And he says on the, on the forum there, he's like, look, I'm not, I, I do read them all, but I'm not going to respond to them. It takes too much time. Um, and so I was like, all right, cool. Uh, and I was, wasn't expecting to hear anything else from it. But then someone else came in and they're like, actually, you can just press N from the minimap and it brings up the, the thing and you can rename the level. <laughs> and I'm like, ha ha, 
gotcha. <laughs> so I sent a link to the bug report that said, I'm not going to fix it. And I was like, ha, I got one. I got a live one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not going to fix it. I, sp I assume, he, yeah, I'm not going to fix it because I'm, be I'm going to be rewriting the whole thing anyway. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Why, I think, I think that's got to be what house? he meant. Why repaint the house? We're about to bulldoze it and build another. I, I kind of <laughs> right. see where that's yeah, coming yeah. from. But it's really annoying to like, yeah, here's where that bug exists. Go away. <laughs> it's like, that's not the answer. That's not why I submitted a bug report. I didn't submit this because <laughs> I was curious how you fucked up. <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, I am kind of curious how, how that happened. And now I know, but that doesn't help me playing the game that I bought from you. And like, right. come on, have a little humility. Be like, this would be a real pain to fix. I'm going to overhaul the UI later. Like, that at least would be, you know, demonstrate to me some good faith. So anyway, it was, uh, right. it was, um, it was humorous. And uh, it's not like it's a game breaking bug or anything. So it's still a good time. I'm having a good time with it still. Yay. You know what I'm having a good time with? <gasps> Tell me. I got uh, one of my Christmas presents early. Ooh. Um, so last year it was the chair, or was that your birthday present? That was my birthday present back in August. I'm going to read you the description of this product from Amazon. <clears throat> Something unicorn LED string curtain lights for teen girls room. <laughs> Wait, what? Start over. Something unicorn LED string curtain lights for teen girls room. Wow, Seamus. I, I had no idea. <laughs> right? It's um Have we been misgendering you this whole time? No, no, no. But I think I think somebody gendered a product they should not have. Because <laughs> uh, hashtag boys like rainbows too. As my as my as my disco LED keyboard will attest, boys can also like rainbows, and that's okay. Nice. So is this like on so, your wall now, or do you actually have okay. a curtain across the middle of your room? Here's what it is. I've got this closet. It's just, okay, This the, my office is a bedroom that, you know, we just pulled the carpet out, so I've got wood floors to roll my chair around on. And there's a closet here where you would normally put your clothes, but I don't need a closet for clothes. I put a bunch of equipment in there, like the router and... Jeez, I forget what all this stuff is in there right now, but, you know, it's a bunch of stuff that plugs in. So we can't just... You know, there's no outlets in there. So it, the closet door would just... It's sliding closet doors, and they'd just be open all the time. Well, that looks ugly, so why have them? So let's take them out. But then we've got this big opening. So then we got this idea. Hang a sheer curtain over it and put lights behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And it looked real cool when we did that, but my dream was these, it's like a curtain of rainbow lights. Okay. Almost like a... And unicorn teen girl's bedroom curtain right that's what that's what i was thinking unicorn teen girl's bedroom it also i actually <laughs> for comedic effect i chopped off half the name the full name is and you can tell this is somebody doing search engine optimization with their product name here's the actual full yes. name <laughs> something unicorn dash led string curtain lights with dimmer switch for teen room girls room college dorm nursery kids room decor perfect for unicorn fairy and rainbow decoration standard version that's the product <laughs> perfect <laughs> and i was like perfect for unicorn fairy and rainbow that's that's right up my alley. I need that. That's me, the unicorn fairy and rainbow guy. <laughs> I just do the video games thing on the side. <laughs> so now I have this wonderfully, this wonderful glowing rainbow curtain beside me and it makes me super happy. 
every time we so like is it just up, like color changing like every every second or whatever it smoothly fades to a new color no no uh for rainbow the 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 killer here is that the lights on the top are purple and then the ones below that are blue and then green and then at the very bottom it's red oh so it's not like rainbow all the different colors in sequence it's like all the different colors all at once right so yeah I got rainbow lights and they make me happy. Every time I light up part of this room with LEDs for the next like two weeks, I'm just so happy every time I walk into my office. I'm like, yes, another <laughs> glowy thing. It looks really cool. Right? I love it so much. It is my favorite kids room decor perfect for unicorn, fairy, and rainbow. It's just <laughs> so wonderful. <laughs> oh, man. I wonder what the the non-standard version looks like. Right? <laughs> I actually looked, and this is kind of the only string of lights that does this. So, I don't know. Oh, also, it has like eight different lighting modes. Eight or not. I mean, there's a lot of them. And only the last one is steady color. All the rest of them are blinking. So, you, you turn it on, and then you've got to hit the button over and over and over until it stops blinking. And some of them are really stroby. And I question that design decision. Shouldn't the steady, non-strobing lights come first? Why do I need to why do I need to scroll past the seizure hazard to get the common use of this item? Oh, I found it. Premium version. Something rainbow LED string curtain lights with remote. 14 girls room, girls college dorm, nursery, and kids room decor premium version. But you know what's really funny? This version came with a remote that I will never use. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, I, what's okay. the difference then? I know, I know. I've got a remote right here. I haven't even taken out the plastic thing that, you know, connects the battery so that it begins functioning. Because I'm like, right. why would I ever... I never want to change it. It's right now not blinking. And I want it to continue not blinking forever. <laughs> I don't want to, like, activate the remote and then accidentally start the blinking again. Anyway. So it apparently has, like, a heart rate monitor on it or something. <laughs> heart rate monitor. That's what, I assume that's what the button does. They don't have any labels. There's one with a heart rate monitor and one with like a hammer and sickle? Is this like the communist heart rate monitor version? <laughs> the seizure monitor. All right. All right. Well, we should issue them an award for most rainbow unicorn something like if for LEDs in girls dorm. Man, I would love to have like a nursery slash college dorm slash fairy den of some kind. Like that would be, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right. It would be funny to just decorate my office as the most stereotypically teen girl room. Like what you'd get in like, not what actual teen girl rooms look like, which is just, you know, a room. But like in the movies when they were in a like, this is the girl's room. And so the walls are all pink and there's unicorn stickers on the wall and rainbow and and like yeah, it's everything's really painted white top. and there's like curtains festooned from the ceiling and right baby dolls everywhere and it's like okay okay movie i get the idea i know who lives in this room it'd be funny to do it my office in that style <laughs> I don't, but for how long how long would it be right funny? right and it's only funny if people see it and like nobody sees my office in fact that's the point of the office is to be my <laughs> fortress of solitude. My, my Half my job is keeping people out of here. Anyway, uh, two weeks ago was the Game Awards. Ooh. Now, it, this, is, it seems like there's more than... Are there more than one Game Awards? I believe there are, but this is the big one. This is the main one. Because there's the Steam Awards, and I think there's another... I think maybe Metacritic does some sort of award thing, but the Game Awards is the big one. What was what happened this year on the Game Awards? I don't know. I didn't watch it. I don't care. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't just, watch it either. I Obviously, I didn't even know it existed. So Right. 
here's the funny thing. This was this used to be a big important thing. And this year everybody was just sort of like, oh, the game awards. Why am I still watching this? Apparently the ceremony was three hours long. That doesn't and seem right. The the show is put together by Jeff Keeley. And I respect Jeff Keeley. He's a cool guy. I mean, he's part of the meme. If you remember the meme from years ago, um, it was somebody being interviewed on this set that on one side of them was this giant Mountain Dew display and on the other side of them was a giant pile of Doritos bags. <laughs> and they were wedged that sounds between right. them. And it, and it became like this meme of like, this is the video game industry today. Um, that was Jeff Keighley in there. So he's... I don't want to call him a sellout, but he always seems to sort of he genu genuinely loves this hobby but he's not above a bit of commercialism to pay the bills and i i don't disrespect that but yeah, the guy it's like it, if you want to if you want to make money being a video gamesman then you've got to you've got to make that money from people who have money because it's the right. video game people don't have money you can't run a company on you know, just community money. I, I, I support my own little self, but you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be running an empire on my Patreon. <laughs> right. And I, you, you, if you want to scale up and put on a show like the Game Awards, you've got to kind of, you know, put on the six inch stiletto heels, slather yourself in makeup and kind of be a bit of a media whore. And that's okay. But the guy's problem. But the guy's problem is he has trouble saying no. This is my read on him. He doesn't know when to say no. And so, mm -hmm. like the video game awards, like has it's already a three-hour ceremony and it's just packed with musical numbers, right? Like that takes Wait, a, like a full music. Yeah, musical number. Like somebody in you know, live band comes out and plays the theme for whatever game or whatever. Wow, and, uh, that's involved. Right, right. These are big. I mean, this is a real show, like an E three style, big production value, huge venue, lots of people come to it type show, live audience. It's not just like except a for live this stream. year. Yeah, I don't even know. I don't know what they did this year because I didn't watch it, and I realized that. I didn't play any of the games that win, that won. I didn't care about it. And I wasn't even that curious. And it sort of feels like the only thing from the show that people were talking about were the previews. And this goes back to the E3 problem of what we're really hungry for is what games are coming out, especially this year since so many got delayed and canceled. What's coming out? What's next? What, what are we looking forward to? What am I going to be? Who who wants this sixty bucks I've set for? I've set aside for summer. I'm going to give somebody yeah, my sixty bucks. Didn't get bucks. to spend it on anything. Right. I here I've got sixty bucks for how I'm going to spend my summer when school gets out. Who wants it? Show me your games industry. And that's why people watch the game awards. But then the people that put on the game awards want the show to exist so they can give each other awards like the academy awards but to fund the thing you've got to put in promotional shit and all of those three interests merge to make the show longer and longer so you need the promotional stuff so you can put on the show so you can give the awards but then to get people to watch you have to put in previews and it's just this <laughs> right feedback loop oh, that no. makes this ginormous like like okay, just po just post it to somebody's friggin' blog, and I'll, we can like look and see who won and argue about it later. <laughs> like, it turns into a three, a three ring circus, right? So I don't know. People were very down on the game awards this year, just rolling their eyes, sighing. Okay, this would be cool if it was just a video posted to YouTube, 
but having this music number in the middle of this show that I'm trying to get through. I've been sitting here forever, I'm tired, and I just want to know who won Game of the Year. Stop wasting my time. Yikes. What do you say we do some mailbags, Paul? All right, let's do it. Dear and precious Diecast, In the middle of 2020, me and my friends started playing D&D campaign, which I was running. During the coronavirus, we used a virtual tabletop called Roll20. I am actually familiar with Roll20. I used it for remote gaming myself. This program allowed well, me to use a huge library. Use? <laughs> <laughs> not answering that. Oops. Not conscioning that with a response. Huge library of sound effects, music, pictures, visual effects, and beautiful maps made by its lovely community to enhance the atmosphere of each session. Since that worked very well, I was adding more and more of these things to the game. However, at some point it backfired. Usually I could just describe all the stuff that was happening, which would allow me to react quickly to player choices, but once the narrative switched to being more visual, there was no turning back. Showing half the things and randomly describing half the others felt very weird and disconnected, so the whole story was increasingly constrained by the limitations of what auto-visuals effects I could use. Basically, I overdid the usage of the props, and it made the game much more linear. This makes me think of video game designers that are facing much of the same issue, only on a larger scale, by wanting to enhance the experience for the players, they may be limiting themselves with the new cutting-edge technology, especially since this kind of technology is prone to bugs and issues. Also, I excluded more marketing-oriented issues. Do you think that more story designers should be playing some kind of tabletop sessions? Not D&D, &D, just anything that's related to this type of game they're working on. To experience potential issues, not necessarily the ones that I described, that make long, interactive narratives can bring. Cheers, Derek. Thank you, Derek. This is that's very fascinating. That is really, in that is just such a brilliant illustration of the problem. Like, it seems like, oh, here's something extra that I can introduce that will add to what I'm already doing. And what you realize is you've, you've put yourself in chains. You've trapped yourself. Yeah, it's, it's like a... Well, it's like altering the expectations of the player, right? Because the game isn't really the systems and the and the dice and the character sheets and stuff. The game is playing with the players, like the GM and the players yeah. playing together. It's like a dance. And when you alter that dance, it changes the way that you dance. And so like adding visuals or, or going online or, you know, all these things, it changes how you can perform that that play yeah and i mean really the classic the the classic example of this is voice acting which we've had for like 20 years now but like you think about the radical change that happened to rpgs as soon as voice acting became a thing it vastly changed how rpgs are built and what kinds of content they can have in them yeah and and it reduced the uh, amount of faith, I guess, that the developers had to have in the player's imagination. Right. I just think of Planescape Torment, which is like sort of the pinnacle of RPG, of text-based RPGs just before voice acting took over. I don't know if I want to call it the pinnacle. People would probably haggle with me over that. But, you know, one of the high... Yeah. high a lot of people marks. would agree with you. Yeah. And I remember, like, every time you open a dialogue with somebody, it's like four choices, seven choices, nine choices, like nine different things I can say to this person. And, and then, you know, f fast forward 20 years or whatever, and we've got Fallout 4, where you have four choices and they're all the same thing. <laughs> four choices, scare quotes. Right. And yeah, we gave up. It kind of happened a little bit at a time, but we sort of gave up everything that the genre was in, you know, just like this person was realized they were being more and more constrained by this extra media they've introduced is games have like every time you add another layer, you're adding another constraint. Yeah, um, and, and it's it's about hitting that that golden that golden line there where 
too little constraint, you can be like, all right, let's sit down and play a game. Who's got an idea? And it's like, well, that's no fun. Like, you have to have some constraint. But then having too much constraint is like, oh, now I've got it. all these, the history of this whole country and all the and the players have all these alternate universes and that, oh, no, too much stuff. There's too many, you know, carrying too much weight. So you have to kind of, you have to kind of feel that out. And it, the thing is that it's not like that line, that, that perfect, that perfect balance is the same for everyone. So then you have the the real challenge of, which is why tabletop is so incredible because you can tailor the experience to those people on that night at, in that location, right? Like it's, it's a tailor-made experience. And for video games, it's a lot harder to do that or maybe a lot easier, like because you can hit feedback into it, the right. game can be more responsive, but it's also not an AI, like it's not like a GM where it can take into account, you know, the stuff that you talked about before the game started and what it knows about you and all that stuff, right? Like it, it just can't do that. And uh, so in that sense, like the the tabletop is really superior even though it's technologically much more ancient. I'm, I'm going to play contrarian here, and I'm going to kind of stick up for adding these more con these more kinds of content for a second, because it gives me a chance to talk about something that I really admired about Cyberpunk 2077. Mm. So real early in the game, you're planning a heist. And the people in the, you're gathered in a room with, you know, your co-conspirators. One of them is your buddy, Jackie. He's a street, he's a big hulking dude from the street, right? He is a passionate guy. He loves big, he carries big guns, he loves life. You know, you know the archetype, right? Yeah, yeah. Gregarious. Oh, yeah. Always got your back in a fight. When he's sitting, we're all in this meeting room talking about the, the logistics of this fight. And the whole time his leg is bouncing, you can tell he's impatient. He's bored. You can tell by his body language without him having to say, this is boring. Can we get to the part where we shoot people? You can see as the other players are talking, you can look over at Jackie and see visibly that Jackie is bored and his leg bounces until the moment where he starts talking about the money and then he's interested. Beside mm. him is T-Bug. She's a chair jockey. She, you know, hacks into cyberspace. She basically sits in this recliner all day. Chair jockeys don't eat, you know, they, when you're in cyberspace, I guess you don't get hungry or whatever. So they don't eat much. So they're always skinny. So she's real thin and she's just in her, you know, body suit or whatever that she wears for net running. And she's not sitting on this couch normally. She's not comfortable doing that, so she kind of like curls up in a ball on the couch because, you know, in her line of work, that's just, she's not used to sitting on a couch, right? Yeah. She's so like, she why am I here? What, what's, right. what's going on? And then Dexter Deshaun is uh, the guy who put the job together. He's big. He's he's a heavy set guy but he's also very grandiose he you know wants to be seen as like this godfather type figure so he leans back in his chair and gestures with his cigar right so these characters are being conveyed through their body language and that's something like i could sit here and you know how long did it take me to describe this scene to you a couple minutes to describe how these people are moving and why it's important to their character but in the scene it's just your brain takes that in automatically your brain automatically sort of senses this about the other characters and that's something that i mean you can do it through verbally the way i'm doing it but it's not very efficient and it sort of brings the 
flow of the scene to a halt. So you can describe tiny details. So this is something that you can only get when you go big budget and you're willing to do voice acting and mocapping and scripting and all of this stuff to make this incredible looking scene. You can get this extra stuff in. And what I'm sort of thinking this in now in the middle of this long spiel I'm doing is I realize so many games land in the dead zone between these two. They give up all the freedom that text get, you know, they, they saddle themselves with all the constraints of voice acting and, and body language, but then they don't take that one step further and use those things to help tell the story. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, I think the trap that Derek fell into here where he, he was using these things. Um, and, and it, added to the atmosphere right like he started using them for a purpose but then he kept on adding them not for the purpose of making the game better but just because it was fun to add things right like was this stuff you're adding um i did this same thing with my players i would often like when we go to a new environment i'd i'd throw a new you know i'd turn my monitor towards them and every time we went to a different environment i wanted a new mood i'd throw up a new wallpaper it was kind of this PowerPoint thing I had that I'd scroll through it. And often they would look at the image and go, well, what's that? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. This image isn't literal. This is, this is just a set of mood. And what I should have been doing is if I wanted to do, if I was going to do that, then actually incorporate that image in so that when they look at it, they are getting something that they're not getting from my words. Yeah, yeah. Or, and even just like Photoshop it, right? And like smudge out stuff that doesn't fit or whatever. Right. Can we talk to that yeah. guy? And I'm like, that. that's... Wh what do you mean that guy? <laughs> it's just part of the picture. Like, yeah, you can talk to someone around here, you know, if you want to talk to one of the villagers, <laughs> say so, and I'll, right. you know. But like, what do you mean by that guy? <laughs> I didn't mean I would this do is that the sometimes. entire town. There was... Yeah. There was one uh, one campaign I did where there was like a bunch of overland travel. I I remember um, uh, not Jerry Holkins, but the other Mike Krahulik did a campaign and he talked about it on the blog on Penny Arcade about how they were having a lot of fun doing the exploring thing and he kind of shared the mechanics they were using. I was like, oh, that's cool, and I I was setting up a campaign so I integrated that for the like the overland travel mechanics and stuff, and then I did a bunch of um not a bunch, I don't know, like six or, or eight or something, little pencil sketches just with colored pencils for just like the different terrain types. And so right. I, since I made it myself, I could just put in the detail I wanted. You know, I didn't have ancillary, or, you know, extraneous details and stuff. But it was really fun to just kind of like put that on the table and be like, here's kind of where you're at, like this kind of place. And uh, yeah, it's setting the mood is like, it's it's really nice. But like you said, you have to be careful to not lazily add more detail than you need and it's like the what was the letter that mark twain or someone wrote about like i'm sorry this letter is so long but i didn't have time to make it shorter right right getting them distracted with extraneous details that's a really interesting t this whole this whole question is really interesting yeah it's a good one it's a keeper thanks derek hello seamus plus guests of the future Probably Paul. Whoa. This person corrected. This person correctly guessed that you would be co-hosting with me. That's a, How did they do that? Anyway, their email reads, I recently got to read a three-part blog series from the lead designer of Battletech. Having bought, played, and loved this game, I found it fascinating to see a lead designer's take on their own work. In it, she echoes a lot of the themes I've seen in your work as well, namely in the importance of writers and writing to deliver an appealing game. She also talks about the compromises made and some of the mechanical things you'd find interesting as a game maker yourself. She also mentions the hill she fought over and damn near got fired for in the design process. To bring this around to a question, what's the biggest hill in a game slash software design that you fought over? Is there one you wish you fought? harder for 
thanks go Stu. So I will have links to this blog series in the show notes. It is real good, um, particularly the hill that she fought over. In fact, uh, I'll tell the story of the hill. So it's Battletech where it's kind of like XCOM. You've got your base stuff and then you've got your on the mission stuff, right? Like on the mission, you're, you're on your at back at base, you're preparing your mechs and dealing with personnel and that end of the simulation. And then you'll begin a mission and now you're just running around in giant robot suits blasting each other. Right. And the base stuff is more turn based where there's no immediate time pressure, but you can't just like wait for things to happen. You have to like go to the next month or whatever. And then whatever. missions, yeah. it's all like real time or, or much more time no, no. pressure involved. No, no, no. Missions are turn based. Oh, okay. But yeah, there is some sort of time element to the, I, I forget now it's been a year since I played Battletech. I also really liked Battletech. Um, although it was too much for, it was so long. Like I was battle teched out before I got to the end of the game and it was good, but it was, it was more battle tech than I was prepared to take in. <laughs> but anyway, an Iron Man experience, huh? Right. So when you're at the base, you can have random things happen. There are random events and you'll see these in other like, um, grand strategy games. Stellaris has these. Where it's, you'll get a pop-up saying, oh, Bob, you know, found a stray cat. And, you know, you can have Bob give the stray cat to somebody else, or adopt it as a pet, or cook it and eat it, right? Like, those are your choices. Sure. Whatever, whatever. Hmm. And these games have these little, and the choices aren't big, this doesn't change the direction of your empire or your squad or whatever they're just moment slice of life moments and for bob it's in battletech it would select one of your pilots that you've got who are otherwise just sort of interchangeable people you've got a name and a portrait right they don't i don't know if they're auto-generated or they're pre-generated but they otherwise don't have much presence in the story except for these little moments where, oh, Bob is, you know, maybe adopts a cat or cooks dinner or two people get in an argument, right? And he creates a little story. <laughs> these are all, I'm, in my mind now, these are all like the same event, right? Like he either cooks the cat or <laughs> he adopts the cat or he has an argument with a cat. <laughs> yes. Or he falls in love and they run away together. <laughs> Yowling. So, this, I forget her name, the, this lead designer wanted these in the game, just as I've described them. And I'm sitting here agreeing with her. Yeah, this is a fantastic thing. It gives you a slice of life, and it sort of brings the characters to life. Now you know there's a story, like XCOM, the original, would have benefited from something like this, that would so that my mooks weren't all just portraits and names, that a story could happen between them. And I'd get the sense that, hey, there's stuff going on in the barracks while I'm managing the money. People are falling in love or getting in fights or playing cards or, you know, c scraping together the resources to cook a fancy meal to liven their lives up while they sit in this underground bunker, right? It, it yeah. breathes life into that story. One of the other designers objected. It's like, where's the commander in that? Like, you're making this decision for Bob, but you're not playing as Bob, but you're deciding what Bob does with the cat. Are you saying that Bob literally comes to the, to the player character and asks what to do with this cat? Are you saying the, the commander literally... He decides who falls in love or who cooks dinner. Like, this is a... <laughs> that would be an and, interesting game, but no, that's not what you mean. Right. It's just, no, you're not making the... And her argument was the player is not the commander. The player is the player. And the commander 
is the main character that they control, but they can also make decisions elsewhere in the game. And this was a hot debate, and I kind of see the other side of it, like they have this metaphor where you are controlling the commander. And so therefore, all your decision, it's like, hey, this book is is written from the viewpoint of this one character. You can't just jump to somebody else's viewpoint, except, well, yeah, books do that all the time. You jump into some side character's point of view for, for a couple of chapters. Um, yeah, it's actually the mark of a, a good book, usually, like, or or it's the mark of a bad book that it can't ever jump away to any other characters. Right. Like my most recent book. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, uh, I mean, uh, it's also it's, the mark no, of genius. It's too... No, nope, <laughs> changing topic. Too late. Uh, no, no, I mean, that's fair. And that's, you know, people criticize me for that. People found that frustrating and limiting. So that's a fair criticism. But yeah, and that's what they were arguing for in this game. And she fought for it, and I don't remember... I think she got her way? Or... I think what we got in the final game was compromised. In that the commander had to be involved in them. I forget how it resolved itself. Anyway, these articles mm -hmm. are fantastic. So, what's... Do you have anything that... Because I've been talking for a long time. Unlike usual. Is there anything in a project you worked on that you wished you fought harder for, Paul? Um, I I have had uh, I've had a few software. I, my main like at work, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I don't deal with software a lot. But I have done a few software projects, and um, the ones that I'm in charge of, I don't usually have to fight for features. I'm just like, this is what I'm going to do. This is the way that it should be. I will do it this way. And sometimes right. there's pushback on that, and I'm like, no, you're wrong, and you can't make me. So, <laughs> right. so it's not really fighting in the sense, in that sense, where I like have to convince someone else. Uh, I'm not much of a salesman. So I, I'm usually of the the mind that like if something is a good idea, then it should be obviously a good idea. And if right. someone else doesn't think it's a good idea, nothing I'm going to say is going to convince them it's a good idea because. Obviously, they can't see it. And so, anyway, yeah, bad salesman. Um, oh, I, to that, I would argue that also being a mechanical engineer, there's often, you know, in a video game, there's not always right answers and wrong answers when you're dealing with the tone of the game or what kind of character yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot but, of soft you know, questions. Right, but in mechanical engineering, there's often like, here, let's go to the blackboard and I'm going to prove you wrong. No, your idea doesn't work. I'm right because right, of math. Right. Yeah, or like, look, this is the way that everyone does this and they do it because of these reasons. If you try to violate one of these reasons, then you're going to have problems and that's why no one does it this way or whatever. Yeah, they're, they're, or like, people will die. And, and like you make a bad video game and people don't die, like it's fine. So so the, yeah, the questions the are often support, like the middle support pillar on this bridge is ugly. I don't like it. We should leave it out because it's so ugly. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna cause problems for for all the the shipping, right? Like the boats are gonna have to go around it. It's like well, it's too bad for the gonna, boats. Yeah, it's gonna mess up people's vacation photos. The that pillar's going to be right in the way of this landmark. Uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's a good place to be in where you can be like, look, physics, man. I can't argue with physics. Um, but that said, there was one project that I was involved in, which was making the, um, the big programming, the big trees in Minecraft. And the original code that I wrote for it had the ability to make trunks that were more than one block across and i put it right. in there and i'm like hey you know this is like this is how i i wrote my script and so you should put this feature in and notch was like ah, i don't really like it i you know and on slopes sometimes it overhangs a little bit and i was like well yeah. we can fix it and he's like no I, I think we should just leave it out like we should just have one one block and at the time i didn't i didn't really fight for it but then like over a year later i think they did add trees with multiple blocks in the trunk. And I was like, oh, come on, man. Like, we had that ability way back then. 
I should have pushed for it. I right. should have fought harder for that because I knew it was the right decision. Like, I knew that that's why, like, how you had to do it for really big trees. So, I wish I'd, I wish I'd fought harder for that. I don't. I'm a non-confrontational person by nature, and I, I'm a little like you, Paul. That if somebody doesn't agree with me, I'm often like, well. They don't agree with me. Like getting frustrated and burying them in words is not going to change their mind. So I just have to deal with their. It doesn't matter even if they're wrong. If they've looked at the evidence and they still disagree, there's no reason to keep fighting. Right. <laughs> right. It's it's like the the to gamers charisma is a superpower. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I. There is a feature I wish I'd argued for, not longer, but better. Like, I don't wish I'd fought more for it. I wish I'd sm I'd fought for it smarter. Way back in the, in the early aughts, Active Worlds was kind of at a crossroads where a lot of the company wanted to go for e-commerce and distance looking, or distance learning. So, like, a company would come to us and, like, we want you to build this training simulation for our employees and i thought that was a bad way to go because that's a very limited niche market that we were serving mm -hmm. the way i wanted to go was have more scriptable stuff more ability to like do things give end users more tools that they could use to make their own experiences so you put a you know you put an object in the world and then you put code on that object to change its behavior and nothing like that really existed yet today uh roblox is what i was arguing for like almost <sighs> exactly like i was arguing basically for roblox but i always did it in terms i always argued for it in terms of wouldn't it be cool this would be so cool look people could make games with it that would be cool but i wasn't arguing with it in terms of we could make money and you know we had a small company <laughs> wouldn't it be profitable right i never made that argument and that was an important argument we were not a rich company we were struggling all the time so we always had to follow the money and Today, if I had mm, the wisdom of my 50-year-old self available to me at 32, I would have made the case that these features will please our existing user base. Yes, they don't spend much on us, but it will bring in more of those people. And those powerful tools will also make it easier for us to fulfill these contracts for the distance learning people if we put in the work now then all of this contract work will get way easier next year when we have better tools and we won't have to we won't have to make special versions just for this one client we'll just be able to you know write a little script for the client and it'll be way better yeah. and less of a headache and because we'll and be experts in our own tools we'll be able to use them better than anyone else. So we'll still be able to sell them to our clients, even if the clients technically have the ability to do it themselves. Right. Right now, you are selling the time of our program, our most precious time, programming time, to these clients. If you, if we did things my way, they, we wouldn't give them any programming time. The programming time we're going to spend this year, and then it will be artist time and you know level designer scripter people their time's much cheaper and more available they have a lot more free time and we'll be selling them their time you know here one of our level designers will make an environment for you with the appropriate scripts that's how i would have made it but i i didn't have the business acumen i mean i still don't have much but I didn't have it back then to understand how I needed to argue for these features. So that's my regret. It's a good one. Could have made Roblox. Right? I was trying to create Roblox in 2004. <sighs> we even talked about, um, what's the scripting language they use? I forget. It's a really common one. Anyway, we were talking about using the same scripting language back then. 
So yeah, it basically would have been Roblox. It would have been very similar graphically. Roblox today doesn't look that much different from Active Worlds did in 2004. Doesn't it have more like Minecrafty though? Is it voxels oh, the art or, style. Or, or not? Oh, the the art style is a little different, but in terms of their lighting model and the you know the types of ways you can light and place models around the environment, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lua! I just looked it up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Lua script. Yes, that's what we were talking about. Adding Lua script to objects, so you could just attach a Lua script to any object in the environment. That was the dream. It did not happen. And today, Active Worlds is dead. Just like CDPR. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the great questions this week. Um, that's it. The mailbag is empty. We normally have a few that roll over the next week. Our mailbag is empty, so if you've got a question, now's your chance. Send your question to diecast at seamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say bye-bye, Paul. Bye-bye.